Everybody, they said, regarding this particular entry, everybody's gone after him because the multitude were expecting his arrival, but not in judgment. Even though he came in judgment, they were expecting that he would come as king and that he would declare himself on the throne at that time and that this would be a miracle like when he had raised Lazarus from the dead, all of those people said, well, he's going to do a big thing. Now, let's go. Let's give him a big hand. He did a big thing. He came in judgment, cleansed the temple. These were the people who were shouting, glory, hallelujah. Come Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the same gang cried, crucify him, crucify him. No man of God can build his ministry upon people. It has to be built upon God and the accuracy of God's word. Because people will praise you one day and cut your throat the next. That's right. Unless they have a renewed mind dedicated to the word. They were looking for a miracle. He had raised Lazarus. He had healed two blind men as they came out of Jericho. They thought, well, boy, he'll establish the kingdom. We'll get rid of all this Roman stuff in Jerusalem. And instead of us being oppressed by the Romans, we'll beat the H out of them. That's what they thought. But it didn't quite turn out that way. Because he didn't come to bring a sword to kill people with. He came to bring the sword of the word of God, which is the deliverance that sets people free. Only the word of God in the heart and life of a man or woman will ever change that man or woman. Only the word of God is that which makes life worth living. This is the close of his ministry here upon earth. A few hours, a few days later, that same gang that was meeting him as he was coming in crying, here's our king, our Lord, cried, crucify him, crucify him. The same group said, we want Barabbas and not Jesus. In the opening of his ministry, when he first began to move with the greatness of God's word to God's people, Israel, in the second chapter of the Gospel of John, you have a great record from God's word. which every harmony of the gospel says has to certainly be out of place because it just can't fit here. The commentaries say it's out of place. We do not believe it is out of place. We believe it fits like a hand in a glove. In the second chapter, in the 13th verse, and the Jews' Passover was what? At hand. Well, now, how often did the Passover come? Once a year. <laughs> so where do you get the idea that this record here in John 2 would have to be the same Passover you just read about in Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. This has to be an assumption. That's all. It can't be the same Passover. The reason it can't be the same Passover is because in chapter 2, you have only the opening of the ministry of Jesus, the beginning of it. 
He, the first miracle he did when he started his ministry was the miracle in Cana of Galilee. In verse 11 it says, this is the beginning of what? Which Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. Well, if it's the beginning, it's what? Not the end of his ministry, it's the start of it. Jesus' hometown was Nazareth of Galilee. Remember Luke 4. When he opened his ministry, he opened it in a synagogue in, in, in Nazareth. And he said, this day is the scripture fulfilled. From Nazareth, he starts toward Jerusalem. Why toward Jerusalem? Because it is getting toward the Passover time. And he has to fulfill the word of God. And the word of God said that the male was to present himself at the feast of Passover. So he heads toward Cana of Galilee, where we have this little miracle. And from Cain of Galilee, he moves on into Jerusalem. I have never been able to figure from God's word the duration or the length of his ministry here upon earth. If this we're going to read now, as right after the opening of his ministry, the Passover, and then, if they crucify him at the next Passover, his ministry would have lasted how long? One year. I do not know how long his ministry lasted. I can tell you what I believe, but that doesn't mean that I know. I personally believe that his ministry lasted about a year and three months at the most. That he started off in Nazareth of Galilee, that he went from there to Cana, did these things and others that fit in, went to the Passover, then he kept going for one year, and the following year at Passover time, they crucified him. Maybe someday I'll understand more of the Word of God and I can put more of it together, but I've worked this thing and I, I just don't know anymore. That's all. I also know this, that there is no indication in God's word that he would have to be, that his ministry would have to be three years in duration as the commentaries teach. And I think about all of us were taught this in our church-related life, right? Uh, I do not think you can prove that. But I can prove that we got two Passovers because I read your word before and I'm reading you the first one now. He comes to the Passover, goes up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those that sold what? Oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of the money city. When he comes to the Passover again, a year later, two years later, three years later, four years later, I don't know just when, but when he comes back, finally, for the Passover, he enters into Jerusalem first as the king, and he finds the same situation in the temple then as he did when he opened his ministry. A couple of days later, he comes back in in the triumphal entry, and he finds the same thing in the temple again. On three occasions, in the word of God, every time he gets to the temple, when the Bible talks about his coming to the temple, he always had to clean the place up. You can imagine his first entrance in the temple. He finds them doing this. And it says in verse 15, And when he had made a scourge, a whip of small cords, he drove them out of the temple. Uh, the word and is both. 
Uh, I don't have this marked in my Bible. You ought to mark it in yours. You got it in yours? I don't know why it isn't in mine. It ought to be in mine, too. But you got and? Both. Uh, he drove them all. He drove them all. All lot. Both the sheep and the lot. Oxen out of what? The temple. And, and, now the and is right, in correspondence with, right? He poured out, he overturned the changers' money over through their table. Verse 16, and said, and said, and said, he didn't drive them, but he what? Said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. There you have it. Beautiful? <laughs> Look. <laughs> a fella hits his finger with a hammer and he takes the dub hammer and throws it up against the wall or out of the wind. <laughs> Does a hammer understand any of that? <laughs> or he drops a bucket of water on his big toe. And then he turns around with his left foot and kisses it. <laughs> Great thing. They sit there and talk to it. The sheep and the oxen who cannot understand reason, those he used the whip on. The tables that you can't reason with. The tables that you can't reason with. This teaching table, I can't reason with it. If this thing was out of order, the best thing to do with this is what? Overthrow it. But to human beings who have reason, he didn't use the whip. He didn't take them and throw them out. He said to them, he said, he said to them, get out. Now that fits all the other gospel records too. When he came back in to cleanse it again, and when he came as king, when he came as judge, he never used a whip on people. He used a whip on animals. The inanimate object that couldn't understand the whip, he overthrew. But to those alive people who did have reason to those he said. He spoke to them, he reasoned with them and said, take yourself out of here, for this is a house of prayer, and you have made it a denizen. That's how great and wonderful this word of God really is.